So <clears throat> once again, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you to talk on the altar. I had asked for liberty to move in a different direction, but still the same thing on the altar, talking about the Holy Spirit as much as today is Pentecost Sunday. So I want to speak about you as an altar. You as what? An altar. You are at that, liberty, man of God, whatever you, if you okay, feel. Okay, thank you very much. That you are. So uh, I want to talk about you as an altar, the altar that God made. You are created in the image and likeness of God. I love Psalm 8, you know, which is one of my favorite Psalms. You know. It says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that thou visitest him. That made him a little lower than Elohim. That's what's there in the Hebrew. You have made him a little lower than Elohim, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. He says, you put everything uh, under his hands, the moon, the sun, everything you have created, everything that creeped upon the earth, you have given man to rule over. So that's how important you are, the investment that God has made upon you. Now, there's something important I want to bring out here, you know. When we see the first appearance of the Holy Spirit, it is in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, we see that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. And then God said, and God said. So we see that God did not do anything, you know, apart from his Holy Spirit. So one thing which we must understand you know, is that God works by his spirit and by his word. Let me repeat that again. Mm -hmm. Before God created anything, the Holy Spirit was what? Hovering over the waters, incubating the waters. It was only then that God said, light be and light was. And so God is so much interested in us that he invested so much in our lives. Now, talking about God making us as an altar, a real investment in our life, you know, I mean, like I said earlier on in, in Psalm 8, say, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? If you look at the great planets, big planets, universe, and everything, why is it that God was so much interested in a, in, in, in a small planet called the Earth? and then invested himself in a man. So we see here you know, the principles of God, that God oppressed by his spirit and by what he spoken word. So if you read the rest of Genesis 1 down, and God said, let there be, God said, let there be, you know, light be and everything, you know, bring forth creation, creative ability. This same creative ability God has given to us, his children. Because we see in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21, it says that this is my covenant that I have with you, said the Lord. That is my spirit that is upon you and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, said the Lord from henceforth and forever. That's Isaiah 59 verse 21. God is saying the same way I operated, you know, by the Holy Spirit and by my word. I have a covenant with you, that my spirit upon you and my words I put in your mouth, that's the way you must operate. For the Bible tells us in Isaiah 55, verse 10 to 11, for so, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and board, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, Says, so shall my word be that went forth out of my mouth. 
He shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish that where unto I please, and shall prosper in the things where, where to I sent it. So God is speaking the same thing to us, just as he said, let there be, and, and it was. You no, know? God is saying, as long as you understand that my spirit is upon you, when you're under that anointing, the, the spirit upon you, and God puts his words in your mouth and you utter them out, it shall not return to you void, but shall I, uh, accomplish that one to it has been sent. So that is the modus operandi of God. And we are the seed of God. We are called to operate the same way. Now, when we look at the Garden of Eden, for instance, you know, the, the Bible tells us that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. And then he did something very important. He breathed into man, man's nostrils, and man became. So man became, man came alive by the breath of God, by the spirit of God. So we see that we are, the Bible tells us that we are the temple of the living God. And God said, as I said, I will, I will walk in you, I will live in you, I will move in you. So we, we are the living temples, we are the living altars that God wants to operate in and through. That even as the altar of God was brought before Dagon, Dagon's altar, what happened? Dagon fell down. So the same way, wherever they take our name to, even at the mention of our name, that altar begins to scatter, begin to fall down in the mighty name of Jesus Christ because you are a carrier of God. You are a carrier of his presence. You are his altar and it sits enthroned in your life. Now talking about, the, uh, the, the, uh, about Eden, you know, we see that one river came out from Eden. And when it got into the garden, it divided into four parts. The name of the first one is called Pison, that which encompasses the whole land of Havila, where there's much gold. Now, another one is Gihon. I just want to, uh, to, to give the meaning of these uh, rivers. Another is Hidekel, and then the fourth one is Euphrates. Pison means increase. So increase will, bust, will, will flow from you. That's one of, I, I will explain that later on, not to see what are the rivers flowing out of us? Why did Jesus Christ says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. So what rivers is he talking about? Rivers of what living water? And we know in the book of, um, of, of um, Revelation, we're told that there's a river that flows out of the throne of God. That river flows from the throne of God. That river flows from you, divides into four rivers and begin to flow into the rest of the world. So one of them is called increase, the river of increase. There are people who will come and drink from your river and they will increase because they are drinking of, the, of living water. Water that produces life coming from your altar. Because your altar is the throne of God. God is enthroned. God is seated upon your life. He is Lord and master of your life. The next river is called Gihon. And the word Gihon means bursting forth, breakthrough, break forth, like a mighty tsunami, you know. The word Be'a Perazim. God is saying, I will break forth like a mighty tsunami upon your enemies. So we see that, you know, in, uh, from the altar that we have, there's a flowing fault. There's a flowing fault. There's no weakness. No, oh, you are afraid. No, something is flowing out of you. There's an anointing. There's a grace that's flowing out of this altar that God has made. And you are that altar. So there's a bursting fault. There's a break fault. There's a breakthrough, uh, like a mighty tsunami, river of God, river of blessings flowing out of you. And then the other river is called, it's called Hideka, which means rapid, it's active, you know, it's an active river, you know, it's, it's like a rapid, you know, vehement. And the Bible says that the word of God is active, it's alive, it quickens. 
So that's a river that must flow out of us, you know, the quickening power of the word of God. You say it and it happened. You say it and it's brought to pass. So it's a quickening river as the word of God. And then the fourth river is called Euphrates, which is fruitfulness. And that is bearing much fruits. You shall be fruitful. That's what Euphrates means. So these are the four rivers that came out of the Garden of Eden. You know? And these are the four major rivers that must flow out of us. When we go to the book of John, John chapter 7, if we start from verse 38, the Bible tells us that on the last day of the feast, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, if any man thirst, let him come to me. And what? Drink. And out of his belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. So we drink from the throne of God. We as individuals, we drink from the throne of God. And these rivers, it, it turns to four big rivers within us. So we uh, let us categorize those four rivers you know, that flow through us to the rest of the world. Now, if we look at the book of Revelation, let me look for that in the book of Revelation, where it says, verse 22, uh, Revelation 22, verse 1, and it showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then when we go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 47, I believe, it talks about a river that flows out. And wherever the river goes to, it brings forth healing. It said there are different types of fruits that grow, trees by the side, so, um, and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. It says uh, in Engedi, People will spread their nets because there's so much fish in the river. You can fish from that river. You bathe in that river, you know. You drink from that river. And that's why you see that civilizations, they are built around rivers because of the importance of rivers. So now God is saying he wants you to be what? Uh, that out of your belly shall flow what? rivers of living water out of the altar of God that you are shall flow what rivers of living water and people will come to that river to drink and be blessed people will come to that river and be healed and be blessed people will come to that river and fish and be blessed riches will come to them you know and different uh, ways that people come to this river and the river, the anointings, you know, like we, like, like the anointing is broken into in, into three parts, you know, the the revelation uh, words, uh, gift, the, the word of knowledge, word of um, wisdom, and then descending of spirit. Then we have the 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 the, the, the utterance uh, gift, which is tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. So if we look at those ones, those are you know, one river you know, combined together like that, three rivers making nine rivers. You know, I mean, nine altogether, but all, you know, I mean, divided into three major parts. And then there is the river of the Lord. Now, uh, okay, the, the other one is uh, the gift of power, which is um, healing, Miracles and and uh, and and the, and the spirit of faith that abides in man. So anyway, the point is that there are rivers that ought to flow from the life of every believer, and the power of this river or the extent of this river depends on whether this river is really flowing and being useful to anybody. Now, we know the way that rain falls. There has to be what? Vapors. You know, vapor rises from the, from the earth, from the rivers. And as the vapors rise, they form 
clouds. If it's a flimsy cloud, you know, wind will just what blow it away. You know, uh, but if the cloud is, if, if a lot of cloud vapors is arising from your life because somebody just got healed through you and the person is rejoicing, jumping and giving thanks unto God, that's a lot of vapor rising. A lot of people are being healed. You pray for people, miracles happen. Things are happening and people are rejoicing. People come, are thirsty. They drink from your water. They go back rejoicing that, oh, we are refreshed. We came to this meeting, we are refreshed. Oh, Father Lord, I give you thanks and all that. These are vapors that begin to rise as you allow your rivers to what? Begin to flow and people drink of this river. They bathe in this river. Somebody came to you, you change their lives forever and all that. They will forever give thanks to God. These praises, worship and thanksgiving unto God are vapors that rises from your rivers. And as they rise up, they form clouds. And the clouds will have to become thick and thicker and become dark. If uh, all over the book of Job and the book of Psalms, I don't want to go too much into all those things, you know, we see the making of rain. How does rain fall? Uh, how, how, how does rain, rain fall? You know? uh, the, the forming of rain. It says, as the clouds gather together, they become thick and they begin to rub against one another, causing lightning and thunderings. And then it begins to rain again. And the, the, the rain will what refresh the earth. The rain will go to the catchment areas. And from the catchment areas, water will begin to bubble forth again, you know, and the rivers continue to flow. But when there are no clouds being gathered, no vapors arising in our lives, and that means our altars are not effective. Our altars are not producing anything. And God says he wants this living water, not dead water, living water. Now, I want to tell you a very interesting thing, me growing up in Lagos, and uh, not too far from my house, maybe about two or three poles away, there's a woman who has a little, uh, we call her Mama Olodo. That's the, uh, the, the woman who owns a river you know, or a stream. And uh, we go to fetch water there. Sometimes we go to bath in that uh, little stream. And I literally saw where this water was bubbling forth from the compound there. You see bubbling forth and then it began to form more puddles and then began to do some little erosion to form like a bigger pond and all that stuff. And just beyond that compound is all marsh. Marsh, total marsh. You know, salt water, marshy water and everything. So how did life enter into that little river? That little stream? Because we saw fishes in there. So how did it come about? So where does you remember that God said, you know, let there be, let there be. You know, where there's living water, it produces what? Life. And so I saw that as a little boy, you know, and it amazed me. I asked myself, where did these fishes come from? Because beyond here, there's nothing that can bring fish. But because it's living water, it's able to what? Produce. So that's the reason why, you know, when the Bible says out of your belly shall flow what rivers of what living waters, water that quickens, water that brings life, water that produces, you know, uh, that people can be blessed, fish in your, in your river, bait in your river and be cleansed, just like lemon, you know, dipped in that river and was cleansed. People want to dip in your river. People want to drink of your water. And so oh, I drank from that water, I got healed. Oh, I got cleansed, I got delivered. These things happen. And so what happens again? More clouds begin to, work, vapors begin to rise and clouds begin to gather and then rain begins to fall again. But when there's no vapor rising, then there'll be what? No clouds gathering. And when no clouds gathering, then there'll be no rain. And then you say, oh, there's drought. 
There's drought in the lives of the son of man. Drought has come because they've not what produced life, which God expects us to what do. So um, today, you know, I want us to really think about it. What life is coming forth out of me? Is it death from the words that I speak? Am I bringing forth death? Is my uh, is is it like a marshy ground, a salty area, you know, where there's no life? Is that what my words are producing? Is that what the living water that should come out of me? Is, is that what it has become? Is it is the river dried up? Is it just dried river bed because there's no rain? There's no joy. Joy has withered from the hearts of men. There's nobody who is rejoicing. Nobody giving thanks to God. Say, God, God has done great and wonderful things, you know, in and through your life. Now, there are rivers in the book of Job. It says this, Job 20, verse 17. It says, he shall not see the rivers, the floods, the brook of honey and butter. Why? because something has gone wrong. But in verse six, Job 29 verse six, it says, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. So there are also diversity of oil, rivers of what oil, not just one oil, but rivers of oil, different oil, different anointings flowing through our lives. You know, that will bless the people. And that because we spend time in the richness of the word of God. Butter, you know, is the is the top of the milk. You know, you, you, you spend time with it, you know, you are engrossed in it. And then what happens? Rivers begin to flow, oil begin to flow in and through you. Now, one of the things why uh people um, rivers don't flow, or people don't know about these rivers flowing, is because there are still idols in their lives. Idols. In Genesis 35, verse 2, Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, say, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. So when you are approaching the house of God, if you truly want to serve God, you cannot serve God and mammon, you know? So if we want this great oil to flow, these great rivers to flow that will bless the people, there are sacrifices that must be made. The Bible says in Psalm 1 verse 3, says, and he shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall what prosper. That's what the river will produce in the lives of people. So that did cleave the fountain and the flood. That drives up mighty rivers. Mighty rivers, you know, of yesterday, rivers that, that they were flowing yesterday, they are dried up because what they needed to sustain that river. No, they didn't do it. They made merchandise of, of this anointing, of these rivers of God, which is what freely given. In Psalm 78, verse 44, it says, and he turned their rivers into blood and their floods they could not drink. So there are judgment that comes upon rivers if we don't do what is right before God. But when we fall in love with God, when we drink from the river of God and give it out freely, then blessings come. Now, let me read Ezekiel 47. Oh, I mentioned it earlier on. He said, and again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured another thousand it was a river that I could not pass over. For the river was risen, water to swim in a river that could not be passed over. And he said to me, son of man, has thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. And when I had returned, behold, 
the bank of the river were many trees on, on one side and on the other. Then he said to me, this water issue out where the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come hither, for they shall be healed, and everything that live without the river cometh shall be healed. Amen. And so when we look at, 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 at Jesus Christ coming to Samaria and with the woman at Samaria, he said to the woman, say, give me to drink. And then the woman said, oh, I, I, we don't have relationship with the Jews. And then uh, Jesus Christ said, if you had known who is talking to you, you will have asked for living what? Water. Mm. Living what? Water. And then Jesus Christ began to speak to her and brought healing and deliverance to her. She ran into the city and said, look at a man that ever told me, you know, uh, everything about my life, you know. So anyway, let's look at the question of the one in John 4, 4 11. He said, the one said unto him, sir, that has nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Are thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of spring, a well of water springing unto everlasting life, that's living water. The woman said, give me this water that I trust not, that I come here to drink again. And then we know the rest of the story. The one thing I want to bring out here is that because of the river that, that came out of Jesus Christ, the whole Samaritan people, they were blessed. Well, one of the questions was this, our fathers, you know, fellowship on this mountain. That what the woman said. But you people say, oh, it's in Jerusalem that we ought to, uh, to, to worship. But Jesus Christ answered and said, the time cometh and now is where every true worshiper will, worship, will neither worship here on this mountain, which is Mount Gerasim. I will refer to that in, in, a, in, in, a, little, in a little while. He said, well, that's Mount Gerasim, you know, and neither yet in Jerusalem. But all true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, what is Manjerism? And what has Manjerism got to do? We have two mountains. One is called Manjerism, and the other one is called Mount Ebal. When the, uh, Joshua was bringing them into the promised land, God told them to raise up an altar, one altar on Manjerism, and that See, uh, that six of the tribes will stand upon Mount Gerasim and pronounce what? Blessings. Then there's another six will be on Mount Ebal where another altar is raised and they will pronounce curses. Well, we see in the book of Deuteronomy 28, you know, uh, 1 to, to 14 talks about the blessings. You know, you'll be blessed going out, you'll be blessed coming in, your bank account will be blessed, your pocket will be blessed, your food will be blessed, everything will be blessed because what? You honor the, the Lord and you follow his word. But if you despise the word of God and he talks about the causes that will come. So every year they go to Mount Gerasim and remind themselves of the blessing of God. And this phrase will what? Pronounce blessing from Mount Gerasim. And then another, you know, the other group will be on Mount Ebal and pronounce Curses. So God is setting before us blessing and what? Curses. Life and death. And he says, choose life this day. 
So uh, that's the important thing about Manjarism. So when we are talking about altars, we cannot forget the altar of uh, uh, the altar of God upon Manjarism or upon Man Eba. But something interesting happened also, and that's when your blessing becomes what a cause. And we see that situation when uh, the people of the Sechem or so, um, one of the sons of, of uh, Gideon, Jerubal, you know, when Jerubal died, of course, they went back to worshiping their idols and all that stuff. Not only that, one of the sons of, uh, of, of Jerubal, of Gideon, decided to kill 70 of his siblings. Killed them in one day upon one stone, but one of them escaped. And that one now went on Mount Gerasim, which is supposed to be the month of blessing, and pronounced curse upon, uh, upon uh, the man's uh, tribe, that's, uh, the, the, that's the mother's people, pronounced curse upon him and upon, that, uh, uh, upon the people. And what happened? That place was salted. It was literally almost destroyed, you know, turned into uh, a barren land, salted, you know, like in the, the marshy areas, giving up to salt when nothing grows. So, but that's, that's the will of the devil for us. He promised something only to what, you know, uh, you know uh, I mean, to steal from us. So the, the altar of the devil does not give anything for free because there's always a price to pay. But one thing I want to tell us is this, that God, the Bible for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So it's life that flows from the altar of God. From the altar of Calvary, life came to us. Death was destroyed. The power of darkness was destroyed. The battle we have been redeemed from the a kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's light, of God's son. That's what God did for us. And the interesting thing here is that the price that was paid as a ransom for us was not the blood of goats or rams. It was not gold or silver, but the very life of God himself. So we can boldly say that the ransom for my life was the life of God. And so the value of my life is God himself. That means God invested his life for my life. But when we go to the altar of the devil, what does he do? The devil gives you, uh, he says, hey, you want redemption? You want salvation from this problem? Bring a goat. What has the devil just done to you? He has reduced you, a, cre a, a creature of God, to a goat. Saying that the value of your life is not worth more than what? A goat. Or sometimes they might even ridicule you more and say, bring a chicken, uh, which is about $8. Saying, oh, the value of your life is not worth more than $8. That's how the devil values us. And especially when uh, in our ignorance, our mothers took us somewhere, you know, they made sacrifice upon our, uh, on, our, on our behalf and they devalued us. And when you look at the government of this world, they don't even value you for anything. They steal all your money and leave you to a hunger and die. They don't have any value for you. But God has so much value for you. And God said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? Then goes on to say, what can a man give in exchange for his own soul? There's nothing that you can give in exchange. The only thing you can exchange for your soul is the life of God for your life. And that's what God has done for us. That's why the psalm said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that thou visited, uh, that thou visited him? Thou put him over all the works of your hands. This is our great God. And this is God that is telling us today that when, if, you, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and let him drink. And out of his belly shall flow what? Rivers of living waters. So is this 
river that flows from the altar where God is enthroned that will reach out to the world and change the world. But the rivers have not been flowing in the churches. And so people are dying, withering away. There's drought, but God is saying, the days of drought are over. And it wants every son, every child of God, hearing the sound of my voice, that the river of God, the rivers of God must begin to flow again. You are an altar of God. God is enthroned in you. And God wants to flow and manifest himself in and through you. We are called by his name. He invested his name in us. We are the children of God. We are his altar. We are called by his name. And he wants to flow in and through us to bless humanity. So today, I want us to touch our stomach. No, I don't know if you, have, you know, see what I'm doing like this, you know. I want you to begin to touch your stomach and begin to say, let the rivers flow. The let rivers the rivers of God begin to flow. Out of this altar that God has given to me, to be a blessing to the world, let Jesus. the rivers of God begin to let flow. The rivers let the rivers of, of living water, the rivers of the God, rivers of that will bless the nation, that will change life, that will bring prosperity that to people, blessing to people, touch heal life, lives. And oh God, let this river flow in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, let the rivers flow, let the rivers flow. Father, Lord God, let fresh and any fall upon your people. Father, Lord, give us hunger, give us thirst. Yes, oh God, so that your rivers will begin to flow. In the mighty name of Jesus. Flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. Let the rivers flow, Father. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus. the rivers of water. Let, Let rivers the kindness of, of my spirit be open. Let rivers of honey, 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 begin to flow. Rivers of honey, O oh Lord, bringing sweetness to the lives of people, Lord. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let rivers flow from this altar, O oh Lord. Let rivers flow in the mighty name of God. In the name of Jesus. Let the rivers flow that has watered us. To bless, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I want to stop here and allow um, also ask some questions from, from um, the past one and the one of today. And then I might hit on some, some highlights again. All right, the platform is open. If you have questions or you need the clarification or something you have heard, I have a question. All right, go ahead. When we, uh, when you talked the other day and you were talking about how we um, break down the altars of the evil that are in our lives mm -hmm. and we went through that. So when you do that, what is the subsequent prayer that we continue to pray over that situation as time goes on? Okay. That is my question. Okay, that's a very interesting question. You know, you see, um, once we break down altars, you know, uh, then the next thing, necessary thing for us to do, you know, is to keep our healing or to keep our deliverance we have to go back, stay in the word of God. Yes. Now, when, we, when, I come, uh, when I come particularly to talk about the, the altar of showbread, you know, the sacrifice has been done in, uh, that's in the altar of, of sacrifice. Now you move to the next altar, which is the altar of showbread, which is the, the bread of faces. The, that bread is, is put before that altar for seven days. And at the end of the seventh day, you know, they eat the bread and they put fresh bread again that is kept for seven days. Now, when you spend your time you know, in the bread of faces, where you are beholding God's face in his word, you know, his word is a mirror. Then he begins to order yourself. The Bible says the 
tests of a righteous man, they are ordered by the Lord. So it is in staying with the word of God, you are empowered. It's like you are charging yourself up. And mm. once you are fully charged, you know, you find out when, when people touch you, electricity flows because you are fully what? Charged up. Now, when you are doing barbecue, before you, uh, before, okay, when you are cleaning your meat, uh, and already, or fish you know, ready for barbecue. Uh, flies are all over the place. But once you fire up your oven and you put the meat on top of the oven, flies are sensible enough not to come near it. So mm. when you spend time in the word of God, you are charged up, you are on fire, you are putting wood on the fire on that altar and that will continually burn. And because of that, the evil one cannot touch you anymore. So that's the way to keep, after, uh, after deliverance or breaking evil altars, stay in the word of God because number one, you already know that you have power to destroy altars. Mm. Number two, you already know the name of God, the covenant name of God. You know, it's like if it's healing now, God says, I am the Lord that he let thee. So we know that the covenant of healing is with us from God. So you stand upon that, say, God, you are Jehovah the doctor, you know, and yeah. then you begin to say the scriptures about Jehovah the doctor, and that big fires you up and keeps you alive because you are protected by the word of God, uh, by the word of God. So it becomes a wall of fire and a wall of protection Jesus. around you. Praise God. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Praise the Lord. Um, yeah. One of the things that we have to also understand is that uh, when demons live in families, uh, it could be for 100 years, 200 years that they've been there, one of the major altars, it's a human being said, we are altars of the God. But how does that altar function? In the beginning, it said, let's make man in our image after our likeness. Our image means to resemble us. Our likeness means our class. So God was made to look like me. Man was made to resemble God and was given a spiritual uh, uh, constitution in the class of God. So, and, and therefore giving dominion to govern everything on that creation. So what the enemy seeks to do is to invade man and corrupt his nature by planting his own nature in the man. By then planting his nature in the man, he is now, he is now replacing God's altar with his, with his own set of altar. So the man sort of become like an altar too. And then he begin to implement his program of destruction, waste control. And, uh, and oppression. So that's why we teach on different levels of deliverance. The first level of deliverance is kingdom change and receiving the life of Jesus or the life of God, new DNA. That makes you a member of God's kingdom and the life, very life of God is now back in you. So it's typically, when people talk about deliverance, this first level of deliverance, kingdom change, authorizes the minister to kick darkness out of you because you are no more in the kingdom of darkness. And by the way, you can also minister to yourself. Now, when, you, when you, this level is done, what you experience is cleansing. Typically, many believers, because of the way they are taught, they think that when you cast out a demon, that is deliverance. No, it's part of deliverance. That is cleansing. That will give you initial peace. 
and a sense of clean, clean, cleanness. There shall be deliverance and then holiness on Mount Zion. But following from that is knowing how to take authority. As I say over and again, the most important thing you need when confronting the devil, number one, your identity, who you are. And then your authority over him. This enables you to fight, take authority, bind him, stop him. God expects you to war, fight him. Why? Because in fighting him, something is happening. Your authority is growing. But something else is also happening. Because you're fighting, he fights you back. You are forced to ask questions. Why is he able to get to me? The Holy Spirit begin to flash his light in your soulish realm. You begin to see portions of your life where you have experienced demonization or corruption, anger, lust. malice, unforgiveness. All of these areas, the light of God begin to hit them. They have to not take the word of God and face yourself. That's why the word of God is a double-edged word sword. It causes the enemy also cause corruption in you. And, and the more you embrace that word, the more you are is cleaning and, and reforming you in the image of Jesus Christ. So deliverance is not just let's get rid of the devil's trouble. <laughs> no, it's why judging the rebellion of the devil, we're also judging portions of that rebellion that have become part of our nature. Where is the meeting point, okay? Well, when you are giving your life to Christ, you are in a community of, of faith, of believers. So mm -hmm. as ministrations are going on, you are getting your miracle, you are getting your help from the exercise of authority of your on your part, on the part of those who are ahead of you in the faith. But you must grow into your destiny, grow into God's plan for you by marinating in the word of God, learning to take authority and fight back and grow in transformation. Is that transformation that kills the devil? I'll give one example. Let's say a problem of anger. Excessive, obsessive, uncontrollable anger that can break out from you from time to time, make you look very ugly. If that's a problem, for instance, that's an access for the enemy. That's a, a point of contact. That's an altar in itself. From where he's able to invade you again, again, again. And when some blessings are coming, he moves in there and, and messes it up. When people just like your character, they are relating with you, they are open to you. After relating with you, that smelling nature begins to come and they run from you. Rejection, success thing. So how do you deal with it? You go to the word of God, Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give room to the devil. That is a word, that's the word of God there, right there. You can be angry, he said, but do not sin when you are angry. How do people sin with anger, for instance? I'm asking an open question now. What is sinful anger? Bible didn't say don't be angry. He said be angry and sin not. So what is sinful anger? We don't judge it by the word of God. I would like him to answer so I know that they own it. Hello, this is an open question. Everybody, I want you to talk. You want to have something to say, you, 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 you make your point. What is 
uh, uh, sinful anger as against anger that is not sinful. I think somebody responded say, by acting on it, you know. So okay, on the chat. Yeah, on the chat, yeah. By acting on it. Okay, I want somebody to talk then. Pastor, I would say that uh, if you were angry and you struck out against the person or you plotted evil against the person because of your anger to get even, uh, I would believe that that would be revenge. Uh, yes. Vengeful anger. Yes. Okay, what well, is somebody else? So that is explanatory, so you also can know and relate to it. If somebody is, uh, you are offended, you are disrupted. Well, that is not immediately seen. <laughs> Anger is to reveal when your sense of justice is violated. And there's something you react. God wants, he put that in you. But how to not sing the yes, amen. Go ahead. Yes, when you allow anger to direct your response, for example, because you know you were angry, you said something that you should not have said, or because you were angry, you took a decision that you should not have uh, taken that would be, you know, in the right in the in the moment after you will regret because. Now it's it's a wrong action or a wrong uh, step that you took because you were led by your uh, anger or you allow anger to lead you into sin, I guess. So that is like saying, if I put it in plain words, you allow the anger to get control of you. So anger was one dictating what you should do. <laughs> Jesus was angry. He drove out the money chargers. But he did something. He brought out people that were sick and lay and started healing them. So he did not allow the anger to get control of himself. Let's talk some more. I'm listening to you guys. Please go ahead. I need a different chair. This chair's not comfortable for me. Um, yeah, go ask us. I don't want to turn from I really want them to talk before you teachers jump in again. I want people to really own this, chew on it. Can I ask somebody else again to read that passage out? Read that passage, Ephesians 4 26 and 27 how to overthrow satanic altars that have been established in your life. Remember, so this is the run through the family, they are genetic fault lines. So the anger you are dealing with is not just you. It's what the, 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 the demons controlling your family for ages have woven into the DNA mix of that family. So you are reacting at what you are. So now you have a new a new spirit working on that area. Is how you overthrow the satanic altar that have been established in your family line. So let's chew on it, for instance, because I respond to somebody's question: Why the persistent problem, yes. even when you have been? Okay. Um, can I say something? Yes. Um, mine is more like um, kind of a miracle that kind of happened to me through the process of the altars that we've been um, speaking about and that you have been teaching us. Um, I built an altar and in my home and um, I literally um, just let myself go, like just let myself go to the Holy Spirit and sat down and tell as God, because what was happening to me was every time I tried to fully give myself to God or 
I immerse myself in 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 godliness to God. Um, bad thoughts would come into my head, even when I was even when I was worshiping. And what the devil had done was, um, my job is um, um, I I clean um, usually patients, so I see them naked. And he would flash the nakedness of the patients and other things right when I'm in the middle of um, worshiping or speaking about God. And, and it, it had been happening to me for quite a while because I remember once I told um, Pastor Patrick and Pastor Mabel and Pastor Patrick had told me, don't, don't bring imagination. Don't, just don't. But it just was not um, stopping. So I went to God on the altar. And I ask why, why he's not helping me? Because for years I've been telling him to help me. And when I sat down there, the Holy Spirit started to bubble up a lot of things in my quiet moment with God on the altar. And he started to bring me back, right back into childhood, right up to now. And, and he was just showing me all the different things. And I was just, I, I had, like in Psalm 51, a broken and contrite heart to God and was crying and asking for mercy because the name of my altar is actually mercy and grace, just his mercy, mercy. I just wanted mercy. And I was just asking him just mercy, mercy, mercy. And boom, it just cleared my whole all the cobweb of, of the wicked, evil images just disappeared. It just it just vanished. And for years, it just wasn't happening. But the altar, uh, the mercy altar, and and um, praying and and begging for mercy and forgiveness through that altar, um, it 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 disappeared. It just go it just left me after the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually helped me more than anything. Very so, powerful. Yeah. So that's why I had asked you, Pastor Patrick, that I would like it sealed that, you know, just yeah. put on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I was just asking my wife earlier on if she has, if she has called you yes, say no, she told that you should call and that the call will be made tomorrow. We're glad for you. Uh, but just to put perspective to this, this is like not building a positive altar, not just yeah. about train, Satan's altar. God had told uh, Gideon, for what the man of God referred to last week, mm -hmm. to destroy the altar of Baal, but to build another altar to God. Yeah. So now this is like she is, she is, she built an altar. Honestly, see somebody brand out there. It's not that it's gonna knock some wood. No, <laughs> it's just like <laughs> you just take a place in the house and hallow it yeah. to God. And this is my meeting point with my Bible and my, my notebook where I, I I offer myself. But the critical thing about this kind of altar that she's referring to is we all we will digress a bit, we'll still come back to this point. I don't know how much time we have there. It will be about 20 more minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's agree now to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12. And read. Romans chapter 12. Uh, are we there? No, my Bible is in there. More than I came yeah, I need, I need some, but my wife is going to read. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that he present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, this is God telling us to form again and offer ourselves on the altar of consecration. He said, I'm pleading with you, literally pleading with you, brethren. But he said, by what? By the mercy of God. Can you remember what she was saying? She was asking God for mercy. What is it that she was asking God for mercy? What 
many, if not all of you, are dealing with quietly. You feel embarrassed, but you don't say it to nobody. You are a child of God, you love God, but certain pictures come into your mind. They hit you and you embarrass. Even in prayer, they hit you. <laughs> and the reason you are embarrassed is because you are ignorant about what is really happening. You don't know, you think that you are one, the one taking the thoughts. No, they are fired by spirits of perversion. Yeah. They are fired, they are arrows, they're throwing those pictures to embarrass you, to shock you, to cause your mind to wander and be disrespectful in God's presence. This is what she was dealing with. For and, years. And she had to ask God for mercy. I want to tell you, sister, that what happened here is that the Holy Ghost came yeah. in consecration and broke it. He did. It doesn't mean that the devil is going to stop throwing them. You experience liberty, freedom, sanity, and purity of mind. So you have to maintain fellowship with the Holy Spirit and really fortify your mind with the word of God. Yeah. It comes That's... down to the word, feeding on the word, marinating on the word. And sometimes when you see that thing flashing, rebuke it and don't set your mind on it. Yeah. In your case particularly, it's taking advantage of your work environment because this is your yeah. job. Yes. Oh, so oh, you oh, have... Oh, it's Satan. And wicked. <laughs> uh, let me read from Second Corinthians chapter. Oh no, one minute, one okay. minute, one minute. Just one minute. Let's laugh at it. Then we get really take a hard laugh. The children of God needs the word of God more than it. anything. The word of God is the is the key. There is certain things. You need to know it, the word of God to help you mm -hmm. because God is on your side. Yeah. What He's actually trying to do is to make you feel in your mind as if God is against you. But it's not, it's on your side. He's the one throwing yes. those things. Mm -hmm. You can sometimes just rebuke your spiritual perversion. Mm -hmm. I rebuke you. I am not that. Right. But you need more the word of God. Go ahead, man. Go okay. Uh, let me read from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, first of all, then I'll back to 2 Corinthians 6. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, you are loved of God, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And then when we go to chapter 6, it says, um, verse 14, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbeliever. For what fellowship hath righteousness? God calls you righteousness with unrighteousness. It says, And what communion hath light with darkness? And then he goes on to say, What concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believed with an infidel? And what, had, what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, read, those scriptures, read one more, you know. Read one more, read more, read okay. more. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you. And I'll be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. So it but says, having touch these promises. Not the unclean. Touch not the unclean. Clean things. Here, you did not touch. The enemy was assailing your mind. It's the battle strategy of the wicked. Assailing your mind to body your conscience. If your conscience is burdened, you are not free in the presence of God again. I have a reason for interrupting there. I'll back off now so you can finish your thought line. Eh? Yeah. There is therefore now no condemnation. So knowledge is a part of this. Knowledge of what is really happening, rebuking it, don't set your mind to me and worship God. If it gets really, really uh, aggravating, 
you can do something while you are in the presence of God, worshiping, be reading the Bible and be praying in tongues. Reading the Bible and be praying, you know, and, and uh, the Holy Spirit will always come here like he did in this case to help you. Go ahead, man, go, please. Yeah, the point I want to bring here is that we, is knowledge is important, you know, knowing that you are righteousness. All those thoughts the devil is trying to bring to you, that's not who you are. You know, God says you are righteousness. You are no, you, you don't belong. To, you you are light. You are not darkness and all that. So these are scriptures that we can meditate upon. You know, when we are faced with certain things, and that's declaring our identity. So God is declaring our identity here, and God is saying, knowing this identity, you no, know, it will bring you to a place of liberty of setting you free. You see, the way the devil operates, which I'll come to when I'm talking about the altar of the showbread, you know, we see that in the, in the book of um, Proverbs chapter 4, verse, uh, from verse 20, you know, it said, my son, incline, it said, my son, tend my words, incline your ears to my saying, you know, let them not depart from your eyes, because what the devil does is that, you know, uh, we are like television screen, and it's what plays. You know, the devil just come and play his video there or his DVD. That's what the devil does. He interrupts us at different times. And certain things will come to your mind that you, in your normal person, you cannot even think about it. You know, this is the way the devil invades our lives with thoughts. But we have to deal with those thoughts. And the way God is saying we should deal with it is with his word, that when we get saturated with the word of God and we begin to make movies out of the word of God, you know, I am righteousness, I am this, I am that, everything that God is saying, you know, then it begins, those are the thoughts that begin to flood our minds and those are the videos that begin to play in our lives and that will begin to push away the videos of the devil. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Just to add to what uh, Apostle Francis has said, you know, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and everything, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. So God has given us weapons and one of the weapons is what uh, you know we'll be talking about the weapon of the word of God. So when we use those weapons of the word of God, you know, it brings down every imagination, whatever thoughts the enemy, enemy is bringing to the weapon, that weapon, we can bring it into, into obedience. And begin to declare this is what the word of God says. Like Apostle Francis said, I'm not, I'm not what the devil is saying I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is what the Bible says. I'm above and not beneath. You know, begin to declare the word of God because what is written is written. So through the word, you can bring down every imagination. Mm -hmm. And also another weapon you have is the weapon of prayer. The weapon of prayer you can use against the devil, against those fairy dust that he, that he, you know, he, 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 uh, that he throws on you. And also you have the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, that's another weapon. So when we use these weapons, the devil is under us. You know, he has no power over us. We have the power and authority over him. And like uh, 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 that is said, warfare is important. You know, through warfare, you can kick the devil out of your business kick the devil out of your life, kick the devil out of whatever he's trying to do, and then you regain control of your... Okay. Uh, if we have one more, more time, we will do further with that. But uh, so we can go back and finish what we're talking about, the anger something. Let's just say summarily, the war on the mind is relentless. Mm -hmm. And the devil is doing that because he wants to cripple your prayer life and your fellowship with God, make you ineffective. Mm. 
the woman that God used to bring me to deliverance. He, he wrote books and explained a lot of things back in the days, in the early 80s, where what they used to do in the marine world. He said, when they see a city that is where people are praying really hot, they will beg, they will, they will, they will bring their ship in the spirit and beg mm. there. Then they will be having all kinds of perverted sex and pornography on that ship and transmitting the image in the spirit to the minds of believers. People will start to have dreams, corrupt dreams. They won't be able to pray again. They will weaken them. This is somebody who was in the kingdom of darkness like confessing what they're doing. So these things that you will face are not ordinary. No. So they are spiritually generated to wear us out. We got to eat the word of God. Eat the word. Eat it. Don't just read or study. Eat it. Let the word of God, not even for the first sake of fighting the devil, let the word of God reform you. So anything that bounces, that hits you, bounces back. Hallelujah. Men will not tell you the fact, but I can tell you that even for us men, sometimes it can be more terrible. We can be in church worshiping, and then there's a wonderful sister that just pop the top open. And that image, boom, hit you. You have to learn how to handle yourself and look away. Nobody preaches on, on decent dressing these days. The fashions of this world that most believer, believing women are copying are sent from hell to defeat men, to pollute men. Yeah. And then if we bring them to the church, we pop up the breast and expose it to our men. What do you want us to feel? Hello? <laughs> it's, it's more in the choir because it's a central area. You know, you will see somebody's leading worship and the song is singing is so good. But you can't look in her direction because the way she's dressed up, all the statistics are emphasized. Yeah. It just drag your mind down. So you got to look away and say, oh my God, if they could dress better, their worship will be more effective. Okay, so especially now we're heading to summer, men, get ready, feed on the word of God. Go. Oh. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> it's reality, it's war, it's war. Somebody said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I look on the maid? They also come to an agreement with his eyes. We'll leave that alone to get to that subject another day. All right. So we're talking about sinful anger. And uh, we're looking at Ephesians 4, 26, 27. And our time is far gone. We have five minutes to wrap up. Let's just read it again as if something there. Somebody read that Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Let's take it from one or two translations, please. As we round up. Be ye angry and see not. Stop at be ye angry. You have a right to be angry. But if you sin with your anger, God will bring you to accountability. Don't sin with the anger. It tells us one way here not to sin with the anger. Let not the sun go down upon your rod. That means don't be angry in the morning. You are still angry by the issue by night. By the following day, you are still angry. What is wrong with that? I need somebody to say something. What is wrong with you being angry over something? Night, you are still angry. What is the major thing that is wrong with that? See light at the door, you know, you are you are meditating upon it and that reinforces it and then you put it into action. Okay, that is true. But what is the major thing that is wrong with that? Unforgiveness, 
like you, you didn't forgive this. It's so part strong. of it, but there's something else that is really there. I want you to see. What's wrong with you being angry? Dwelling on, dwelling on the anger itself. Say that again. Dwelling on it. Like what it is, have you angry? I'm sorry I didn't hear what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you say slowly? I don't know if it's my um computer said so like dwelling on what it is that have you angry. You hear me? You Did you say dwelling? Yes. Okay, said... dwelling on the anger. Yes, what is wrong with dwelling on the anger? I, I oh, mean, a gate for is behind Satan. it all. We we open a gate for Satan to to yeah, the Bible actually with... said that. The Bible I said that. He also said pride, but the thing I wanted you to see, you are disrespectful of God. Oh my God. Yeah. Lack, you lack Very reverence for God. Mm -hmm. The people can do stupid, dumb things they have no business doing, and you are sincerely offended. But after a while, you realize, oh, I can't disrespect the Lord. Because of him, I have to. I have to handle this. I have to cut. I have to let go. I cannot take my anger and leave God. Because anger is not self-justification. You, you marry to that, you divorce God. That's what is so wrong. It's irreverent. And some, some level of anger manifests in such a satanically manner, like a, he was in prayer, that it's literally like casting God out of his throne. You become the God. Have you ever heard people say their self is their God? Do you know what that is? That's Luciferian philosophy. Is yeah, the God yeah. of the self. You are worshipping Lucifer at that level. That's why certain type of anger requires more repentance. Yeah. If you exercise it to that point, it's not even a matter of the person coming to apologize to you now. You need repentance towards God first. Repent. When you repent, in the degree of violation is deep, you ask God to heal you. It will heal your wound and remove the poison. Because sometimes what people say and yeah. do to you is a poison mm -hmm. arrow. Demon speaking through them. Mm. Demon acting through them. That's why you have to recognize to sometimes to, to shut off some people. Shut them up. Don't be not because you're angry, but no. When you have dealt with anger, it is person's consistent source of aggravation. Mm -hmm. You need to shut it off. Cut that thing off. Hallelujah. So you are not constantly being tormented. It's good to love people, but understand when they are under the manipulation of the enemy and then call it quit. Don't bring yourself in fellowship with the enemy. Look at the verse that Proverbs 27. Neither what? That means if you maintain your anger, you have accommodated the devil. You have opened the door for him to rob you. So for that matter, some of you that have a sense trust spirits in the form of marine, the man-made spirits, one of the things is pride and anger, pride and arrogance. You'll be very proud even though you are broke to your teeth. You have no nothing. You will still be proud like a peacock. You will be proud to even those who are supposed to help you until you retain them. That's the nature of that. And your words will flow out of your arrogance. That really requires total humility before God and crying to God. Don't stay that way. I say, this is how I am. Many people just say, this is how I am. This is where my family No, You are a born again Christian. Allow God to chip away by crying out to God. Why I say this to you, I've been on a journey for over 30 years surrounding that demonic anger that flew from my family to God for crucifixion. 
It's a terrible thing. You create spiritual nakedness. And it can endanger you if you are into warfare. So don't nurture it. Reverence God. Fear God. How many of you here advise God? Absolutely. Like you advise president. God is president. You advise God. Are you? You humble yourself. Well, the Holy Spirit, we appreciate you. You're taking this to whatever you wanted to take. Okay. It. Just one statement uh, as we come to a close, you know. Um, the Holy Ghost is our helper. Yeah. He's been called to help you. So let's avail ourselves of the help of the Holy Ghost. That's why he's come to dwell in you forever. Amen. 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 Lord, we thank you so much for your help today for directing this meeting as you have done. We pray for the blessing of your children. That everyone who is listening to this word, Lord, that their lives are blessed. Mm. They are enriched. Mm. That my Father, your mercy will begin to flood their life. We had a testimony tonight. Somebody cried out to you for mercy. And you opened that door. Mm. Oh, may the door of mercy enlarge and bring the flood of God's mercy to your children, your sons and your daughters. May their lives be blessed. May your mighty hand rest upon everyone and power their lives. Thank you, Father. Bless them, bless their families. Bless their children. Oh, bless their posterity on the earth. Let their life be blessed inside them by fire. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I want to say that Amen. some of the things we are talking about now are much, much more. They are in the deliverance that works. I will say the result. I talk the, the I think chapter 13. I talk about practical deliverance. Yeah. And, and follow from there. Some of things to expect. Can I just quickly testify? There's a miracle in the hand of somebody. I don't know who you are right now. Oh God, you better be me. It's it's just here. It's here. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, thank, thank you for Jesus. this miracle, thank God. You, thank you for the needs of your children. Amen. My God. My God. You said the children are thirsty and they are crying for water and there is nobody to answer them. You said you will open fountains, Amen. rivers in the desert. Amen. You pour out the supply. You give them fresh water to drink you, in the Father. desert. Oh God, the one that delights in the prosperity of his servants. You know where your people are right now. We activate this miracle that you are putting in my hand right now. Jesus. We activate this miracle. Thank you. I release it. Your area of need, whatever Amen. it might be right now. Activate it. Let the angels of God go for us. Amen. Amen. I want that need your eyes to open. Mm -hmm. Like hear that crying in the desert, thinking that, oh, my child is going to die. Mm -hmm. And God opened her eyes and she saw it well. Oh, may your eyes be supernaturally open to see the well of provision that God has already placed there. Right now, in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Oh, that's that one that is going through what you consider to be difficult or impossible situation. Yeah, with man, with man, with man, but not with God. For with God, nothing can be Amen. 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 Amen.
move things. Move it. Move it. Let the momentum begin to break in your direction. Let the momentum begin to break in your direction. Thank you, Papa. It's fair. Thank you, Jesus. I call for you. Mm. Right. Hallelujah. There is that child. Oh, yes, that little girl. Mm. I call for her. Amen. For that child. Amen. I call for her. Amen. I call for her. Amen. Oh, God. Amen. 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 That is your mercy. Great is your mercy. Amen. I call for help. Amen. Let your help locate. Amen. That one. Amen. Let your help locate. Amen. Each and every one. Amen. May the help of God make the difference. Amen. Amen. This hour. Amen. 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 Put scriptures. We can talk about strategy. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, is the help and the mercy of God. Amen. Oh, may his Thank mercy. You, Father. Thank you, Lord. May his rich Thank mercy you, Thank you, Jesus, touch your life, you, touch your family, touch you where you hurt, touch the confusion and terminate it. Mercy. Hold you. Let the mercy of God embrace you. Embrace you. Embrace you. Amen. 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 Ah, let the mercy of God bring you to a warm embrace and meet you where you are. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Papa. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you, Apostle Nahu. Thank you. Thank you, man of God. God bless, God bless you. every one of you. Have a blessed week. You are you still too. all expected here in under two weeks. Apostle Naro, these people want to see you when they come for the crusade on my wife's bed. They be available. See, I will do my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. God bless you. God bless you. God bless everyone.